morning. And it is a great day. Uh, all the different, one of the things that people mentioning social media, one of, the, one of the great things it does is it allows people that have talent to not just enjoy the talent, you know, use the talent, but to share them with a lot of other people. And uh, it's a great day that, but we live in a wonderful age. Uh, and you younger people are going to, you know, you don't remember the old days when it wasn't that way. Did I turn my mic on? I got a great life. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need the wall around. I've got two chalk, i got two boards. I don't get to make up for Friday night and half of last night. The micro board last night, you know, I'm thinking, gee, I never doubt. Anyway, it's a great day to, to have an opportunity to minister and so forth. These young people want to, you don't even know what a cassette tape is. Do you? Oh, you didn't? Wow, you got an archive that way. <laughs> and, I was telling somebody the other day, yesterday, we, 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 put, we have distributed tens of thousands of cassette tapes through the years, and I've got machinery in our office where we could make 28 cassette tapes at one time, with one pass. Well, all of a sudden people quit using cassette tapes. The only place I have a cassette player is in my car. I drive an old car, old enough to have, still have a cassette player. Two years ago, we bought my wife a, in 16 a, a, a new car, and I inherited her old one that had the cassette player. And she says that people says only two things I want: one is a, is a memory thing on the door for the front seat, and two is a cassette player. She wanted a six track, a, a six uh, cassette player. And the guy looked at her and said, "I can do the memory thing, but we don't put cassettes in play, uh, uh, CD players. We don't put CD players in cars anymore." How am I going to listen to my CDs? He says, you're what? <laughs> he says, you use your device. Now, when I was coming up, a device wasn't, wasn't what I, that's a, I don't know, what? He said, your phone, your device, all, all, things got like six USB ports in it. You plug in. Now he says, we can, uh, we can get you a CD player, it costs about $1,500. <laughs> He said, but the better idea is to go to Best Buy for $25, buy a, you know, a player and plug it in. I said, that works for me. <laughs> it didn't work for my wife, but it worked for me. And the technology has just boomed in things. I just sent the full, complete set of Grace School of the Bible uh, to a ministry in Asia on a thumb drive. <laughs> The first time we did that, we had we packed them up on the DVDs, the packages, the, all three years, and the guy had to scatter them out through his luggage to smuggle them in. Now you put it on a thumb drive, and you don't need that because it's on the internet. And you can, where this this was going to communist China, and they they have trouble downloading it off the internet so it's on the thumb drive. And I'm thinking, there's my whole life right there in my thumb. <laughs> so about the size of my thumb. But what that does is it allows the technology to get it out there and, and younger people and you know folks younger than I am, all the ability that, that this does is let people that have ministry that's valuable be shared with everybody. And you can take advantage of all of it. And it's just, you know, for me it's a wonderful, I know every kook and nut and, 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 and harebrain out there gets equal billing. But listen, if you can put truth on the table, truth will take care of itself. It'll win the day. Romans chapter number eight. And I want to say thanks for you for being here and for all the work. I think these ladies take a lot of work behind the scenes that you never see. I know that. And we're, we're grateful for the folks that do that. All year long, these, these men are working to make this maybe possible. And uh, we appreciate all the labor there. Appreciate you coming and being here and uh, enjoying the, the time together. Friday night, they had over 50 first time people for this meeting. That, that's a, that's a, a great thing. You look around, there are a lot of folks that usually are here aren't here. So it's nice to have new faces too. And uh, it, that, that demonstrates the interest and so forth. And so we're grateful for that. He didn't put a clock up here, so I guess that means I can preach longer than I want to do, right? Okay.
I have a rule in our place. I'll preach till I'm through. You listen till you're through. And if the, those two don't come at the same time, well, then you know you can do what you need to do. Romans chapter number eight. We're going to finish out our studies this this morning, and my part in it is talking about Romans six, seven, and eight. You're dead in Christ to the to sin, Romans six. You're dead to the law, Romans seven. You're dead to the flesh, Romans eight. You're given a new position in Christ, Romans six. You're given a new program to operate under grace. In Romans 8, you're given a new power, that is the power of the Spirit of God to work in you. If you can get those kind of things in your mind to kind of focus on Romans 6, 7, 8, you'll have an overview of what's going on here. Romans 6 deals with the struggle that, uh, that, 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 uh, that, that we go through. Romans 7 deals with the struggle that we go through. Romans 6 is the step that deals with the principle of sin. You're dead to sin. Then you have this struggle with the law and performing and, and not forming, performing. And, and you have the, the, the answer to the principle of the law in chapter 7 by this new program of grace. God doesn't deal with you with a performance system. He deals with you under the free gift system. Then when you get to chapter 8, your walk. When the Bible talks about your walk, what do you do when you walk? You move from one place. To, you're making progress through life. You just progress through life. It's not, a, it's, sometimes the Bible talks about standing. I need to stand. Withstand. Don't be pushed off. You need to be able to stand in the identity that God gives you in Christ. Sometimes the Bible talks about running, running the race. But the, the term that describes your Christian life most of the time is your walk. A walk is not standing. I'm not standing in the same place. I'm going somewhere. I'm not running. In your Christian life, it's not going to be instant there. It's going to be a slow, steady progress, one foot, one day at a time, one foot in front of the other, where you make steady progress and grow. And when your Christian life is described that way, it's that way because that's what, that's what it's designed to be. Not just stuck in one place all the time, never growing. Not a 90, there are no 90 day wonders <laughs> in the work of the ministry. People give you the idea, you know, come go to my class, go to my school, go, go through my seminar, go through what I'm doing. And in 90 days or nine months, you can be there. Listen, Christian, it, your, the Christian life is a lifetime of growing to maturity in Christ. It doesn't happen overnight. It takes a whole lifetime of transformation. Thank goodness the transformation never stops. You continually grow until the death of the rapture. You go be with the Lord. But the preparation process, the edification process, the mature, perfected saints do the work of the ministry. And it takes some time to perfect. You know, we want to do things quick. You ever stand in front of a microwave and go, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, boil that water? You know, I... My wife is making me a baked potato in the microwave. It takes about six minutes to bake that potato to make it. It takes 40 minutes in the oven. I'm sitting there, is it ready yet? Is it ready yet? Is it ready? <laughs> you, we're so used to things going quick. But you know when God grows, you grow a rose. My, my dad used to grow roses. I never could because I never had the patience. He'd go out there every day and look at that thing, and then as it would grow, he would trim it, and he'd take the suckers off it. And pretty soon there's this beautiful flower. But it took weeks and weeks of work to get there. Now, I just have gone on the floors and bought one somebody had already put the work in, bring it home, give it to my mom. But when you grow one, it's a, the Christian life is that growing process. You're dead to sin. You've been given a new position. You're not in Adam. You're in Christ. That's gives you liberty and life. You've been given and put under a new program where you don't struggle with yourself and you doing it. You performing is Christ performing. You're not doing it to get something. Oh, I want to I please God. I want to have God happy with me. What do I need to do? Listen. 
Pick one. Do you want to do the will of God? Sure. Well, how do you do that? I need to, oh, I need to do this. If I do that, is God not going to be pleased with me? God is pleased with you and His Son. So if you wanted Him to be pleased with your life and your walk, who do you think you need to be? Who needs to be living there? If it's His Son living, He's pleased with His Son. We will carry that. If you want to do the will of God, God's will for you is not about where you're going to be supposed to be at 3 o'clock this afternoon or have for supper. It's not really about who you marry or who you, what kind of job you have. And what, it's those, there, are, there are instructions about all of that in Scripture. But if you want to do God's will, find out what God is doing. That's why that's important. If you know what God's doing, forming the body of Christ today, if you by faith went and did what God is doing, what would you be doing? You follow that? That is such a revolutionizing change of thinking that if you get that in your mind, I'm not trying to strive and find God's will out there in my circumstances and what should I do there and what should... I find God's will in His Word. And then I take what He says in His Word and I go apply it to my life. Your life is the stage upon which you perform, in which you apply, in which you do the will of God that you find in His Word. Don't waste your life looking out there in the circumstances of your life for what God's telling you. <coughs> he wrote a book to tell you what He wants you to know. Then you go out in life and do what that book said. You think what that book said to think. You have the attitudes that book says to have. You have the actions that book has, says. That's why right dividing the word is so critical because God isn't doing these things. He's doing this. And I'll say it again. You've never been big enough a day in your life to make God do something he isn't doing. He does what he's doing. And when you mess around with something he isn't doing, that's you. The Romans say, I finished in verse number one last night because it's the Romans eight one tells you about getting out of Romans seven. In Romans seven, you see the complete total defeat of a man who tries to live in his own resources. And I mentioned verse fourteen last night because. When you read commentaries and you hear preachers preach about Romans 7, there's a lot of people just go, uh, what in the world is that? Some people think it's Paul when he's lost. And he obviously, is, he, he's not lost when he wrote that. But they don't. When you struggle in yourself to perform to gain God's blessings, you look like a lost person. You act like a lost person. You think like a lost person. You've reverted back into the thinking of the, of the old life. And what that gets you, verse 14, for we know that the law is good, is spiritual, but I'm carnal, sold under sin. That is a complete misstatement. I, I, how could Paul say that after he wrote chapter 6? <laughs> well, I understand that, because haven't you ever done the things in verse 15? You know, the things I would do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I do. How to, you know, how to will is present with me, how to perform, I can't figure it out. That's where you get when you're living, when you're trying to do it yourself. When you forget who you really are. And what Paul's describing there is the depth to which you can sink as a believer when you simply don't live in the reality of who you are. You can think, I'm carnal, sold under sin, when you're really crucified with Christ, dead to sin, alive unto God. That's how confusing it can get to be if you follow the wrong program. Verse 24, he says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? <laughs> then he tells you, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God. But with the flesh, the law of sin. But there's the problem. Now, there is therefore, you see that word therefore? 
Romans 8.1 is not a verse about eternal security. People say they love to use Romans 8 saying you start with no condemnation, you end with no separation, and it's all good. But Romans 8.1 is not about eternal security. The first five chapters of Romans has settled that issue completely. Amen. And he's moved on to something else. When he says, there is therefore. Why is the therefore there? Because he's talking, he's giving you a conclusion of what chapter 7 says. So really chapter 8 verse 1 is a summary of what you read in chapter 7. And he says, there is no condemnation. What's that? Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I am carnal soul under sin. He's a guy condemning himself. There's no condemnation. There's none of that Romans 7 failure. The good that I wouldn't do, I don't. The evil that I don't do, how to, to will is broke. How to perform. All that's defeat. To them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Romans 7 is a description of walking after the flesh. Walking after the flesh being under a performance-based acceptance system, the law, is two different ways of saying the same thing. Now, in modern Bibles, they leave the last ten words of that verse out. If you've got a scope for reference Bible, he's got a note that says leave the last ten words of that verse out. If you read commentaries in the book of Romans, written by grace preachers and other kind of people, they say leave the last ten words of Romans 8, 1 out. And the reason they say that is because they think the verse is talking about eternal security, for some reason, never, nobody ever read the second word in that verse and paid attention to it. Those words need to be there. And the reason they need to be there is because the chapter is talk, going to talk to you about what it means to walk in the flesh and what it means to walk in the Spirit. Verse 2, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Amen. Now there's a law you need to keep. The law of the life, the law of the Spirit. Here's the way the Spirit of God works. Life is in Christ Jesus. You've got Christ. I love 1 John 5. He says, He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. End of discussion. If you've got the Lord Jesus Christ, you've got life. The law of the Spirit of, uh, is uh, uh, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. What does it do? It's made me free from the law of sin and the law of death. It's made me free from Romans 7 and from the sin in Romans 6. I get freedom and liberty through life in Christ. You just heard all about that. For what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law. All the right activity that the law demanded might be fulfilled in us, not by us, but in us. There's something in you that's going to produce the righteousness that the law demanded who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So the Christian life, where are we to walk? After the Spirit, and not, not walking in the old resources, but in our new identity. Now what does it mean to walk after the Spirit walk after the flesh? There's the question. Because we, we talk about that and it comes down most of the time to just a cliche. The good thing is Paul brings it up so he can tell you what it is. And the next two verses are probably the most important verses in this, in this issue. Verse 5 he says, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. Now notice in verse 4 he says, They that walk after the flesh don't walk after the, they, those who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. So we're going to talk about walking after the flesh and walking after the Spirit. Verse 4, verse 5, they that are after the flesh. Now what is, what's he talking about? They that walk after the flesh. But you notice he didn't put the word walk in there. And I thought about that. I said, why would he not put walk in the flesh there? And you think about it, and you think about it, and then you realize, oh, <laughs> I believe he didn't put it there so you'd think about it. You'd be puzzled about it. And anything you're puzzled about, you cogitate on, you think about it, you roll it over in your mind. 
And instead of running to a commentary or to the, you know, some, I read a guy the other day, he, I, I read all kinds of stuff. My wife tells me, drives her nuts, that's all I ever do. And I'm reading this guy, he's a he's good guy, great guy, I said great, a, a mid grace teacher. And he was talking about this certain issue, and he says, in the Greek, it says, it, it's a present tense. And when I read that, I thought, I started laughing. He doesn't know what the Greek is. I, I happen to know this guy. And if he ever found the Greek, he couldn't read it. What he had to do is go read Bond's Expository Dictionary to tell him what the Greek said because he doesn't read Greek. 95% <laughs> of the preachers you know don't read Greek. When I went to college, I went to Mobile College in Mobile, Alabama back in the 60s. And I, I took two years of Greek because, you know, preacher guys are supposed to take Greek. And my Greek professor, Dr. W.C. Dobbs, he says, anytime you hear a preacher stand in the pulpit, start saying what the Greek says, he said, do this, take two fingers, stick them in your ears, push hard as you can, until <laughs> it hurts, and then hold it there until you're sure he's talking about something else. <laughs> Dr. Dobbs had a Ph.D. degree in textual criticism and a Ph.D. degree in New Testament Greek. He'd spent nine years studying New Testament Greek, Koine Greek. And he said, now look, I spent nine years graduate school studying Koine Greek, and I speak Greek, read Greek at about a third grade level, and comparative to what you read English. He said, would you want a third grader to be giving you a grammar lesson? <laughs> now listen, he was way ahead of any of us. <coughs> the point is, you better be, you've got to know some more than most people know. A little knowledge. First of all, there is no the Greek. They're talking about the original, the original Greek. There is no original Greek. Nobody ever saw it. Nobody ever had it. They wouldn't know it if they, they couldn't read it if they did. It's a figment of their imagination. Now, that's something else. We're not talking about that today. But then he, the other, the, the thing that really got me was the verse that he's talking about was present tense in the English. It was already right there. You see, what happens is the translators did the job for you to start with. You didn't need the, you didn't need to spend all, he spent a page and a half that he didn't need to spend. I just spent five minutes I didn't need to spend. The work's already there. So when you read a verse like that that says, you expect him to say walk, and it didn't say walk, and you start puzzling, the best thing to do in a verse like that is think about it. Cogitate about it. He said, well, I don't get it. Well, then work on it. See, we want instant answers. But if you think about it, and think about it like this. I did this. Why wasn't it there? And I thought about it. And you know what it did? It made me spend more time in that verse than otherwise I would have. And all what I'm saying now is kind of a lesson in how to study your Bible. But look at what he said. What it, the point is, when he says, they that are after the flesh, he's talking about, here's what somebody who walks after the flesh does. What does it mean to walk after the flesh? They that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. They that are after the spirit, they mind the things of the spirit. So I've got a definition. What does it mean to walk after the flesh? It means to mind. Did you ever say, you got to mind me, kid? You raise kids? If you didn't raise kids, you don't understand this, but if you raise kids, you know. You better do what I tell you. Do what I say. Mind me. Pay attention to what I told you. They that walk after the flesh, who are they paying attention to? The flesh. This is great theology here. <laughs> they walk out of the Spirit. Who are they minding? Spirit of God. You need to understand something about yourself. Where do those markers go? On the board. They're where? On the board. Oh, uh, this has got a tray on it. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to use... I'm going to use both of them. I'm going to use this one first. This bigger. <laughs> Uh, it, when I draw three circles on the board, everybody says, oh, that comes by the record of these three circles. And I, I understand that. But these three circles will help you in your understanding of who you are and how your Christian life operates. You are a spirit, a soul, 
and a body. When God made man, he made a spirit, soul, and body. He formed Adam out of the dust of the earth. He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and Adam became a living soul. He formed his body, he breathed the spirit in him, and we became a living soul. You are a spirit, a soul, and a body. Get two passages. Get Hebrews chapter 4 and Job chapter 14. Hebrews 4 and Job chapter 14. If you ever want to study psychology, the word psychology is the word suke, which is the Greek word for soul. Suke, suke the study of your soul, the study of your inner man. Hebrew Job chapter 14, verse last verse. But his flesh upon him shall have pain, and his soul within him shall mourn. Notice that you have a body of flesh that has a soul within it, and your flesh is upon your soul. His flesh upon him. I have a coat on. I put my coat on me. I am inside of my coat. Your body is a covering of your soul. You have an outer man and an inner man. Notice that your body can have pain. Some of you here know that real well. Your soul can have pain. It can mourn. So in your body, you have feelings. In your soul, you have emotions. You have feelings. You have emotions out here, well, you can't read that for sure, can you? But you're going you're to have emotions out here. Can, can you all see that red? No. 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 Okay. All right, I'll start all over. Second Corinthians chapter 4, Paul talks about your outward man perishing, yet your inward man is renewed day by day. You have a spirit. You have a soul, and you have your body. This thing here is called your flesh, over here. It's on your, it's on your inner man, okay? Look with me at Hebrews, I'm talking about the inner man, about Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Notice, you have an outer man and an inner man, but your inner man has two parts to it. You have a soul and you have a spirit. You would never be able to know the difference between your soul and your spirit except the Word of God tells you. That's why the world knows that they have an outer man, they know they have an inner man. Everybody knows that. You young people don't believe it yet, but when you get to be older, I said last night, I'm a 25, I, I feel like a 25 year old in a 70 year old body. That means I feel like I can do anything you do and probably more. My body says, ha, ha, <laughs> <you're> <laughs> and I try and I don't get there very well. There's a lot of things I did when I was 25 I don't do anymore. You know why? Not because I don't want to, don't have the drive to. I just can't get my feet up that high. <laughs> You're out of man. So you know there's two of you. You know I'm here. You know who Penn and Teller the magicians are? Penn is an atheist. They're both atheists. And uh, the big tall guy is that Penn. He, um, he just lost a bunch, like a couple years ago, he lost a bunch of weight. And he put a YouTube video up that I watched about high loss. He, he lost 110 pounds of eating potatoes. I thought, I don't know, read about that. But he described why he started doing it. And I thought, now this, this is the craziest thing for an atheist to say. He said, I'm, 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 he's like 60 years old, he's got a little 10 year old daughter, and he wants to, you know, see her grow up. If you're 60 and you've got a 10 year old daughter, you've done a tough row ahead of you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's scary. So he wants to live. And he said, I began to sense that there was something, a disconnect between who I am inside and the physical condition I was in. And he said, I'm an atheist and I'm not supposed to believe that. 
Well, you can believe what you want to believe, but reality takes over. But when you talk about that inner man, the Bible tells you there's more than just this inner in, uh, uh, spiritual soul. Uh, it has two parts. It's a spirit and a soul. Now, your spirit has a mind. What man knows the things of a, of, of a man, save the spirit of a man that's in him. There's a mind that your spirit has. It has the capacity to know things. Okay? Your soul... Your soul has a bunch, a bunch of parts to it. With the heart, man believes unto righteousness. Jesus said, my soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. The verse in Job, your soul within mourns. So your soul has some different capacities and different parts to it. It has a conscience and so forth. But for the most part, when we talk about your soul, we're talking about your heart. Now your heart has really got three basic functions in here. You've got a, a, you, you have a mind, a thinking process, you have a, a will, and then you have emotions. Now if the soul has a mind and the heart has a mind, the connection between these two is in the thinking process. The thing that allows your spirit and your soul to, to mesh together is the mind, is the thinking process. They that walk after the Spirit do what? Mind the things of the Spirit. Your body has emotions. The connection between your body and your soul here is going to be in your emotions. You see that word emotion? If you take the E off of it, what do you have? The thing that's designed to put you, make your body go to act, go into action, have to do with your emotions. The things in your soul that stimulate your body to actions come through there. Now that's the way you are. You're, you're made. That's the way you function. That's the way your makeup is designed by God. Now this is a, a short version of it, but that's the issue. Now, as an unsaved person. Well, the Bible talks about your old man. I'm going to put the old man over here. I don't want to make much of him and use a small chart. <laughs> your old, when you, uh, the natural man, there are four different kinds of spiritual statuses. 1 Corinthians 12, verse four, uh, chapter 2, verse 14. The natural man, I'm going to put him over here, receives not the things of the Spirit of God. When you get saved, you become a babe in Christ. He's going to be over here. When you go to maturity, you're a spiritual-minded person, 1 Corinthians 3. If you, or what this verse 6 says, to be carnally-minded, but that's this guy over here. So this guy can be a babe, he can be spiritual, he can be a carnally-minded guy. We'll talk about that in a minute. But he's over there. But the natural man, the way you come into the world, here you are. You've got a spirit. You've got a soul. And you have a body. By the way, I said the other night, Bible never says body, soul, spirit. It always says spirit, soul, body. Because God works from inside out, Satan and the world works from outside in. Now, this guy is dead. You are dead in sense. You are spiritually dead. God, you're cut off. You cannot contact God. He has no communion with you. Your spirit isn't inactive. Ephesians chapter 2, you're dead in sins and trespasses. When in time past you walked according to the spirit of this world. Remember that verse? The, prince, the spirit of the prince. I'm sorry, sometimes my mind goes blank. My mind gets foggy because your mind. Ephesians 2, verse number 2. When in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Your spirit is working, it's thinking, it's operating, but it's not connected to God, it's connected to the spirit of this world. Now who is the God of this world? Satan. So you're connected to the, to the wrong God. Follow that? So your spirit is dead, your soul, and your spirit here, your soul... You remember in, in Romans 1 he says that their foolish heart was what? 
dark and darkened. When you live in the dark, you got no idea what's going on. So your inner man is dark. It doesn't have any light from God. Over here, your body is depraved. It's called the body of sin. It's called your old nature. We call it all kinds of things. So there, there it is. Now, as an unsaved person, and your body and your the, all, everything in this old man comes from this direction. And this the 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 the, uh, uh, the sin in this old the nature out here tells your soul what it ought to think. Your soul doesn't have sense enough not to see the true reality, and it's all motivated by this guy in here. As an unsaved person, that's how you think, how you function. Okay? That is no longer who you are. Now you are a believer. When you got saved, God's Word came in here. God's Word, the living Word of God. Do you remember that verse in 1 Peter? He says, we're born again by the incorruptible seed. Now, I know you're not born again. You're regenerated. But how do you get regenerated? That life-giving Word of God comes in, and God literally implants His life in your dead spirit. You are no longer alienated from the life of God. By His Word, that Word of God, you hear the Gospel, you hear the word of life, and it implants life, God's life. Now you have communion with God. You can talk to God. You can know God. You can connect with Him. Where do you connect with Him? God is a spirit, right? Which one of those three things do you think God would communicate with as a spirit? Okay. He doesn't, he doesn't come in over here. He comes in over here. He comes, Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life, and they impart life. John chapter 1. I'm trying to hurry. John chapter 1. I'm going to have a sore spot in my cheek while well, I'm biting my tongue not to say things. <laughs> I have a whole series of studies uh, of, of, of teaching back there called Inside Out that goes over this in, in, in some detail. But uh, what I want you to see is what it has to do with Romans 8. And, and I think this is the best way for you to get it. John chapter 1, verse 3, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. In Him was life. The entrance of thy work. He, he comes in. His word comes in. And the life was the what? The life was the light of men. How are you going to get light in that dark soul? You've got to get life. You've got to get the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he comes in, he puts light. The entrance of that word gives light. So now I've got light in my soul. Well, my soul is where I'm going to, my will, my mind, and my emotions function. So now I have the capacity. All you, you, know, you remember the verse in Proverbs: "Out of the heart are the issues of life. All of your functioning in life comes out of your heart, which is the mentality of your soul. Everything you do." comes from the process of what goes on in your soul. Because your soul is a part of you that is you that you never share with anybody else. You can share body parts. I got a, I got a horse inside of me. Folks back here love horses. I got a, I got a cow. It's not a horse. I'm sorry. My wife just reminded me. I don't know. Uh, I don't know who. <laughs> but I got a cow in me. They took that heart, that, that aortic valve out and put a cow valve in there. Then they found a, a, a little aneurysm, a big aneurysm, right down the aorta, and they took a piece of sail, a piece of background, and wrapped around that and fixed that. So when the wind blows, I'm going to go, shh. <laughs> <laughs> My grandkids come in, they go, no. <laughs> and I said, that's better than going, <laughs> I don't have a pig valve, so I, 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 I chose the cow valve over the pig valve. 
nothing to do with anything, but just being <laughs> stupid. The point is your heart, your body can have different parts to it. You can swap parts, and it's like the McDonald's commercial, parts is parts. <laughs> because your body's really not you. It's the vehicle that hangs on you. You is your soul that never goes anywhere else but you. Nobody ever shares it. Doesn't have, you, have, you have a spirit, I have a spirit, I have a spirit of man. That's why we can communicate and talk. That's a common pool of life. It's called the silver cord in Ecclesiastes. But the part of you that is you that is unique and distinct that lasts forever is right here. The part of you that you can take you out in, in eternity out there, you will get a new body. This is the dude going with you. Yeah. That's the guy you need to focus on right now. Amen. Now, out of the heart of the issues of life, everything's going to issue out of it. So now you've got life. But your body, what did we learn? This guy's dead. He's no longer the source of your life like he was over there. See, back here, you had a dead spirit, didn't function nothing with God, um, darkness, foolish hearts of darkness, confessed themselves wise, became fools, but you had a, a body of sin that's going to run everything. Because in your man, you didn't have any sense enough not to do that. Now, you've been completely made different. Now, Romans chapter 8. They that are after the flesh, when you read that, you remember Romans 6, you already understand that. Do mind the things of the flesh. So when I'm going to walk after the flesh, who am I paying attention to? This guy or this guy? This isn't brain surgery. You see how easy that is to sit out? You sit down and say, why did I do that? You never ask why. I raised three boys. My wife and I did. She did most of the raising, but I never asked them, why'd you do that? I knew why they did it. They're sinners. They're kin to their daddy. They'll tell you, Dad, he told us all the time, our biggest problem is we're kin to you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's right. You think your kids are perfect. They ain't any more perfect. You know the, greatest, the stupidest thing you could ever do with your kids is to expect them to be perfect? Amen. Expecting people to be something that they aren't is stupid. It's wrong. It's unbelief. Yeah. When your kids screw up, you know what? You should say, uh huh, I knew we were going to do that. God knew 2,000 years ago you'd do that. That's why Christ died for you. That's how you take care of that, and here's how you fix it. You ask not the, the why question should I know the answer to that one. The right question to ask is what? How? What happened and how did you do it? What are the mechanics that led you there so you don't do those you don't make those mistakes again? But we say, oh, what? <laughs> There's this process working. You walk after the flesh, you're gonna get a result. You walk after the spirit, and you're gonna get a result. Now look verse six. To be carnally minded is death. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. To be carnally minded, that is to, to have your mind working under the influence of your flesh life. The word carnal means fleshly. And it's describing a Christian, a believer, a saved person, who is living under the control and the influence of that old life. That guy, you're living like you're over there. Because who runs things over there? The flesh. You're living like this is the boss. It's easy in the verse. To be spiritually minded, I'm paying attention to what God's Word says, is life and peace. You see that? I know, but isn't that really what you want? You want life. You want to have His life be living, your life be His life living in you. Functioning in you. It is in you. And the peace. Peace is tranquility. It's contentment. Titus, uh, Timothy, Paul says to, to Timothy, godliness with contentment is great gain. He didn't say godliness was great gain. He said godliness with contentment when that's enough. 
Can I say to you that if you need anything, to have peace, to have joy, to have happiness. It's because you're living for this guy and not who you're in Christ. Because you have everything you need in Christ. You have everything God has for you in Christ added things are just things they're not reality mm -hmm. contentment is to say he's my all man there used to be a song we used to sing <laughs> we still have street meeting but i'm not a singer <coughs> i played the accordion <laughs> uh, that's because they told me they didn't want me to sing <laughs> I was in the youth choir as a kid, and, 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 and I, I, they let me sing in it because I played the organ for them. And the uh, director took me aside one day and she said, Come here, can I tell you something? Eddie Johnson, their kind of wonderful, beautiful baritone voice. You know. And she said, Stand next to Eddie and mouth it. <laughs> I was lip syncing before anybody knew what that was. Because <laughs> I, I could hit two notes and I didn't get on either one of them. We used to sing that song, I saw the martyr at the stake, the zeal, could, the flame could not his courage take, nor death his soul of all. I asked him whence his strength was given, he looked triumphant to heaven and said, Christ is all. Christ is all. Christ is all. That's it. That's contentment, no matter what. That's walking in the Spirit. That's where that verse... To be carnally minded is death. Your Christian life won't function. You'll be Romans 7. You'll be, oh wretched man that I am. I want to do it, I just can't figure out how. To be spiritual minded is life because it works. And peace, contentment, that's enough. How it works the light comes in here and gives you understanding. With the heart, man believes. Your will trusts it and believes it. And when your will trusts it and believes it, it stimulates your emotions that then go out here and take your body and put it into action. So the process is I take in God's Word. Here's the situation I have to look at. This is why prayer and the Word go together. I look at the situation, I face that challenge, I've got that problem, I've got this issue over here. Maybe it's something I've done wrong or sin. Maybe it's some challenge. I'm... And I look at it and I say, what does God's Word say about that? I take what God's Word says about it. So I'm looking at it, I talk to God. There's, Lord, there's this thing in my life, I need to know what to do. What do you think about it? Let Him tell you. Get in the book. Now right here, you run into the issue of, well, what if I don't know what it says? I'm glad you asked. ta -da! <laughs> Now you've got an actual motivation to study the Word and to learn to rightly divide it so you can know what it is God's Word says to you about whatever it is you're facing. I tell people all the time, I say, you, there's, you're never in a situation you don't know what to do. Because when you come to something you don't know what to do about, you know what to do. Stop and go find out. Don't just keep bull, bull, bull forward, you know, running forward like a bull in a china shop. If you don't know what God says about this, stop. And go find out what He says. But our flesh says, wait a minute, that's that, wait a minute. And you start, listen, you ever worry about stuff? Worry is taking the future and projecting, you know, some bad thing into your future. And that's why he says, don't do that. That kind of anxiety, that kind of work, worriness, that kind of hurt. But he said, don't do that. We said, well, look, it either is or it isn't. So what did your worry, did your worry help any? 
What it was was a distraction from what you should have been doing. You know what worry is? It's this guy over here talking to you instead of God's Word talking to you. So you take God's Word in. Let's take two illustrations. One is, I go over here and I've got some sin that I've committed. My conscience has accused me, brought me to conviction about it. The Word of God is for doctrine, reproof, correction. So the Word corrects, uh, reproves me. People say, how does God discipline you today, chasing you today? Doctrine, reproof, correction. He does it through His Word. Maybe you've got that Word hidden in your heart and your conscience pulls it out and accuses you with it. Maybe you don't. Some of your friends and your relatives, this is why it's great to have a bunch of associate believers to be with in a local church. They notice it. They see it. You that are spiritual, or you, you see some overtaking and fall, restore him. So they bring the scripture to you. They don't bring an accusation. They bring the scripture and say, hey, look, here's what the scripture says. There's a... But eventually, even with that, you've got to go back and let your conscience has to submit itself to God's word. So you do. So now, when I see that I've sinned, what does the scripture tell me about my sin? Christ died for my sin. It doesn't tell me that I need to be, feel shame, rejection, alienation, cold shoulder from God. I need to understand that's the sin Jesus Christ died to forgive 2,000 years ago, and he forgave me that sin. Now that does two things. It tells me I don't need to be immobilized by my failure, which is what your old sin nature does. It takes your sin and immobilizes you from any... I mean, your old sin nature says, we got to go face the judge and he's going to be mad. I don't want to go. But now as a believer, you said that's the sin Christ died for. So he, if the issue is settled but as far as the justice of God is concerned, but wait a minute, that sin has no place in my life. The grace of God teaches me to deny ungodliness and worldliness. Get rid of I need to find that thing and get rid of it. Colossians 3 says, mortify the deeds of the blood. You know what mortify means? Kill it. Kill it. Go kill it, man. Find out how it got in and root that thing out. Have you ever dug out dandelions? <laughs> Did you know people up north eat those things? <laughs> I actually saw a, farm, a dandelion farm in Pennsylvania. So where are the people in Pennsylvania? <laughs> big city on both sides and a lot of strange stuff in between. And I stopped and got off the road and went down to look. I wanted to, and there were people growing dandelions. See, some of you guys, you think, I, you think that they're great. Well, when you get them when they're young and tender, they're not like, but I'm talking about the dudes that are in your yard. And you go pop that thing out, you know what, you can do a good, you know their roots can go like that. Now, if you're going to get rid of one, you've got to go way down there to get rid of that sucker. I want to get rid of that sin. And I might have to work through my life way down to work, but I deny that thing. Now I'm going to focus on getting rid of that thing in my life because that doesn't belong there. My motivation is Christ put it away. But instead of it immobilizing me, or destroying me, I can deal with it successfully. I can do what God's Word says with it. I can put it away. I can put on correct behavior in its place. Somebody says, I need to get married. Well, who should I marry? You know, God doesn't care if you marry a tall one, short one, Fat one, skinny one, rich one, poor one, bald-headed one, big-haired one, whatever. He didn't care. First thing he says, only in the Lord. Number two, it's your choice. So don't get married and blame God. <laughs> now he gives you a whole lot of instructions about relationships and marriage. There's very little in the Bible about marriage. It's pretty cut and dry. There's a lot about how to relate to one another. So there are a lot of things you need to consider when you think about getting married, and you can get a lot of instructions about all those things, and you bring all you bring all God's word to bear. And I'm gonna make that decision based on that. 
Walking in the Spirit is just taking the instructions of God's Word, understanding them, believing them, and then they will work effectually in you that believe. They work out through your through emotions in your soul. You know, if you have if you have pain in your body, it tells you there's a problem. Emotional pain tells you there's a problem in your soul. And when you suffer emotional pain, it's a buzzer to tell you that there's something not working properly in here. And what happens more often than not is you live in the revolt, the tyranny of the revolt of your emotions, because your emotions say, I'm going to tell my mind what to believe. And the, instead of going this way, you begin to go that way. Emotions, mind, and your mind tells your will, and your will is confused because it doesn't know what to do. Because your, your emotions are in charge. And your emotions are not... Your emotions have no brains, they have no will, they have, they have no knowledge. Your emotions are responders. They don't have any intellect. You know that because you know that you cry at things that aren't real. You get happy about things that aren't real. My wife told me the other night, she says, Wow, an affair to remember is on TV. Have you ever seen an affair to remember? The real one? You know, and you watch that stupid thing, you know, most of you, most people now it's only, uh, you know, sleepless in Seattle, but that was the modern version. And at the end of that thing, my wife watches that, and at the end, when, when the guy comes in and sees her on the couch and realizes what's going on, he's so damn. She's crying. <laughs> and I look at it and I say, it's just a stupid movie. <laughs> it's not real, but your emotions don't know that because they respond to what they're seeing. And you're drawn into it. You can watch a horror movie. <laughs> Fred Krueger's coming. And you go, ah, I know. And you all say, I don't any danger, you're sitting in a stupid movie theater, <laughs> sucking on a Coke and eating popcorn. <laughs> you're okay. But your emotions, because of the, what's projected on your mind, you do the same thing that with life. And then your emotions tell, tell your mind what to think, what's, what's real. That's backwards. Your mind's going to tell your emotions what's real. So if your mind is telling, is, is programmed with reality thinking, grace through faith, your will is believing that, what does it tell your emotions? It tells them what's real. And they will respond. And you say, but Brother Rick, it didn't work for me. Jesse will actually used to tell us an illustration about, he said, I, I decided I was going to get up every morning at 6 o'clock and pray. Read my Bible and pray. You're going to read my three chapters of Romans. Here's what's going to happen. You're going to say, I'm going to get up every morning at six o'clock, read my three chapters of Romans and pray about it. So you, you get up the first three or four days and it's all exciting and it's fun and your emotions say, what's he doing up this early? <laughs> I don't think I'm going to go. <laughs> and you go on and go anyway. And after about the third day, the fourth day, you say, you know, I'm not having any joy, 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 joy because my emotions aren't coming. And the next day you get up and you look over at your emotions and they say, I ain't getting up. <laughs> and you say, okay, I think I'll lay here. Who won? But if you get up anyway and say, I don't care if you're going on, I'm going because I've made a choice by faith to do this. About a week later, after your emotions, you said, I'm not going. And they start kicking and screaming and you say, I'm going anyway. And you make that choice of faith to go. Pretty soon what happens with your emotions, see you've trained them to just lay in the bed. You've trained them to have their way. Now they aren't having their way, so they pitch a hiney fit. But you just keep by faith going. And what happens then is your emotions, you get up one morning, you, you, you say, I'm going to go read my three, my three chapters. By now I'm reading six chapters a day. I'm spending even more time. And your emotions say, you know, I wonder what he's doing out there. Sure, sure. And they, they just go and they watch and they say, hmm, it's not so bad. 
Next day they get up and they say, well, might as well go with him. He's not going to. Where should they go? That's kind of interesting. And the next day you get up, you know, it might take three or four days. You get up and, oh, well, here we go again. And they go, and they look over there and they say, wow, that's, that is, tell me some more about that. And they begin to get involved. And pretty soon, you wake up at six in the morning, Moses says, hey, get up, we got to go. We got to go get our verses. But see, that doesn't happen instantly because you spent a lifetime of training your emotions with sinful, sinful patterns, sinful activity patterns, and they're, they're dumb. They want to know what they've been trained to do. And now you're in the retraining process. But in everything, the, the emotions are not designed to be the controlling factor. What is the Word of God? And it's your faith in God's Word that causes it to be the energizing uh, uh, power in your inner man that causes the truth of your Word when you believe it to work and it'll, it'll work in these emotions as they respond to that. I'm going to quit, but that's, that's how you work inside, folks. And that's the key, that's the template the paradigm that works in your inner man. So whatever the issue you face, you find out what, you get the life of God's Word, the light of God's Word into your thinking, then you believe it and say, that's what I will obey. Amen. The obedience of faith. And then regardless of the circumstances, your emotions, anything else, you simply walk, you simply mind the things of the Spirit of God. And that produces life, and it produces peace. And peace is where your emotions eventually come. That's, that's the life. That's the power. That's the living, that's the walking in the Spirit. In verse 14 he says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, that is, this is how they're living, like, a, like an adult in the family, are the sons of God. That's how you become, you demonstrate, you manifest yourself as a full-grown son in the family. It all starts when you get the life. You get the life when you trust Christ. He said in the first hour, I actually wrote it down, he said, when you older people get saved, you don't instantly feel young. I thought, oh, that's a neat idea. <laughs> I hadn't thought about saying it like that. Because you're, what goes on in your spirit is not a feeling issue. It's a spiritual issue. So when you get saved, you don't feel like a baby. But you are spiritual. And then you grow. And as you learn to walk, little kids come up here, they learn to walk. That's what you're learning. I'm going to function with my mind. My, now over there, you function backwards. The lost man, his emotions tell his mind and his will what to do. Your emotions tell your will what to want. A lost man wants out of his wills, out of his emotions, out of his wants. That's why the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life is what runs this guy. That's the wisdom of the Lord that comes in. And his will is bound by this. And his mind over here is darkened because it doesn't have any light. Thinks that's true. When you get saved, it's all changed. You see, being a grace believer is not is being first to mid acts dispensation. Second is to understand justification, the justification of life, and then understand how life works in you for God's glory. Go make it so. Father, we thank you today for your love and your grace and the time we can spend together as, as saints of a true and living God. Thank you for your word. And I pray that it would work in our hearts. 
the exceeding excellency of the power of your life for your glory as we trust it. We thank you for that in Christ's name.